Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. Each week, we address issues of timely and timeless concern with newsmakers and the journalists who report on them, artists, scientists, educators, social scientists, government leaders, politicians, each are one to one. I'm delighted to welcome Esther Cohen, who defies easy categorization. She's executive director of the Bread and Roses Cultural Project at Local 1199, the not-for-profit cultural arm of New York's Health and Human Service Union, with 380,000 members. She's also written and edited several books, but we'll start with her latest one in collaboration with illustrator cartoonist Roz Chast. Don't Mind Me and Other Jewish Lies has just been published by Hyperion. Welcome to the show. Welcome to you. Esther, what does Jewishness mean to you? Is it a religion? Is it a culture? Is it an ethos? And how would you define your religious beliefs? Wow, that was... <laughs> and in, in 60 seconds. <laughs> that was a pretty large question. First of all, I want to tell you how happy I am to be here. And uh, second of all, I have no idea how, how I would define what it means to be Jewish, except this, that there are thousands of ways for every Jew there are probably... Uh, two perspectives. That person probably has two notions of how he or she feels about uh, being Jewish. You know, a, a friend who is in politics in Israel told me that um, Israel has more political parties than anywhere in the world. And I would guess that Judaism has more definitions of Judaism than any other religion in the world. So I wouldn't presume to uh, define Judaism for, for uh, every single Jew. Mm -hmm. But for you. But for myself, here's what I would say, that um, what, what always interested me about Judaism is the notion that there is no answer, and, and it's, a, it's a theology and a culture and a way of living life that has thousands of forms. And the one consistent aspect of all the forms is the notion that one questions. So, you know, somebody, I, I read a book once that explained how Freud and Marx came out of Judaism because it's a theology of questioning. You know, there, there was a very famous scholar, um, Moses Maimonides, who wrote these books of commentary that people have been studying for thousands and thousands of years, and all the people who study them write questions about the questions. That's, that's really the notion of what the religion is. It's a religion of, not of answers, but of questions. But of questions. Carrie Kennedy was, has been on this program to discuss her book, Being Catholic Now, and she talked about the dichotomy between the church, the church's teachings, and Catholics' personal beliefs. Since there's no pope in Judaism, <laughs> is it easier to reconcile your personal beliefs with the teachings of, of Judaism? I think we all think we're the pope in Judaism, and may maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe that's a way of answering the question you asked earlier. You know, that the authority figure idea in Judaism is really quite different. Everybody wants to be the authority figure. So uh, I, I also think it's a, it's a culture of very strong personalities, and many people believe that they know something or other a little more than another person might know that same something or other. And, and so, you know, the specifics of the theology, unless you're, you're a very traditional kind of person, and there are many people who are very traditional and follow the 613 laws with, with um, absolute clarity, most of the rest of us, you know, create what we do on a daily basis. Um, is there a difference between Catholic guilt and Jewish guilt, do you oh. think? <laughs> you know, somebody, somebody uh, a few minutes ago said something very interesting about that. She said that uh, Jews are guilty for what they didn't do and Catholics are guilty for what they did do. In other words, I might be guilty because I didn't call my aunt yesterday because it was Sunday, whereas a Catholic might be guilty for having done something that he or she was not supposed mm -hmm. to do. I mm -hmm. don't know if that's true, but it sounded good. Well I, you know, I was raised Baptist, and I think Baptists feel guilty about doing, having a good time, whether it's, really? having, whether it's having sex or, <laughs> or dancing or part, going to nightclubs or drinking. Now, this doesn't keep them from doing any of that, uh -huh. but, but they do feel guilty about it. Are you a Baptist still? Um, I'm a probably, probably a lapsed Baptist, uh -huh. but you know, the, the, these things carry, they stay with you. 
You know, mm -hmm. I think you you carry what is useful to you with you, even though you might ne necessarily go to go to church anymore. Mm -hmm. um, your book, Don't Mind Me and Other Jewish Lies, mm -hmm. suggested Jews, or maybe it's just Jewish women, I don't know, <laughs> tend to say the exact opposite of what they mean. Is this a passive aggressive kind of thing <laughs> or, or what? And where does it come from? Well, you know, I don't think anyone would accuse Jewish women of being passive aggressive. Okay. Um, Although it's kind of an appealing idea, but I'll, I'll tell you where it comes from. You know, as a child, I grew up in a uh, very small town in Connecticut called Ansonia, and um, we were Jews in a town where there weren't so many Jews. And I think uh, for one reason or another, there were a lot of Jews in my house, visiting my house quite often. And their primary sport was talking. That's the thing they did. You know, nobody played tennis or swam or jogged or anything, they talked. They sat around the living room and talked. It wasn't only women who talked, the men talked too. And um, even as a little kid I knew that what they were saying was different from what they meant and it was kind of a convoluted narrative that they all understood. So uh, if my mother's friend Bernie, who lived across the street, came to visit and she did every single afternoon, Every single afternoon, my mother would say to Bernie, would you like a cup of coffee? And Bernie would say, don't bother. What she meant was that she was dying for a cup of coffee, and my mother should hurry up and get some cookies, which my mother, <laughs> which my mother did. You right. know? And that was the nature of my life. So, so what are these... these but I so wouldn't what are some other examples as, of these kinds I, of lives? I wouldn't lives. define it as passive-aggressive. Uh-huh, you know? uh-huh. Um, uh, you know, uh, I wrote 300 lies, um, and the, the book, Don't Mind Me, has 50, but the re there's really an infinite number. Um, m my favorite was You Go First. That wasn't everyone else's <laughs> favorite. But, but I have to say that growing up hearing people say, you go first, and knowing that no one ever meant it, mm -hmm. you know, they, they wanted to go first. Uh -huh. They didn't want me to go first. But they had the semantic awareness that telling me to go first was what they should do. So, so it's sort of um, an exaggerated form of politeness or kind of? It isn't even politeness. It, it's kind of a bizarre language. You know, uh -huh. it's, it's, I don't mind. You know, people people would say, oh, I don't mind. My grandmother. When they really she, do mind. Yeah, they really do mind. It doesn't matter. Nothing. In, in my family, there was not one thing <laughs> that, that didn't, didn't matter. matter. Right. <laughs> so, so pe but people would say quite often, it doesn't matter. And I would feel chills, you know. <gasps> because she knew that they really, it really mattered. <laughs> right. Mattered. Could, could this book have been written by a wasp? Or by a black person, do you think? And, and well, I have to tell you that many years ago, you know, I've always loved comedy. Many years ago in the 70s, I heard Richard Pryor at Town Hall, and it, it was the funniest stand-up performance I'd ever heard in my entire life. And I felt like everything he said could have been Jewish or black or, mm -hmm, or mm -hmm, anything. Mm -hmm. But, but the, he had a really basic understanding of human nature and the convoluted way that we all talk to one another. And I thought it was Jewish, but it was mm -hmm. also black. Well, one great thing about Richard Pryor is that he was such a great, he understood human psychology so well. 100%. And, you know, he was really great at that. What's the biggest guilt trip ever laid on you by your mother? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that's a hard contest. <laughs> My mother laid many, 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 many. You know, uh, once we had a very big fight when I was, uh, it, it was a few years before my mother died. I was in my 40s, and we were at an airport in uh, Florida, and uh, she was really yelling at me. My mother was not a yeller, but for various reasons she was yelling at me. And the end of it, she said, you could have been the high school valedictorian and you weren't. You know, it was... <laughs> It was, it was a long time ago, and and she felt that I didn't because I, you know, went to the prom with the wrong. Because you went to the prom with the wrong guy. Yeah, and had I, you know, had I chosen a different sort of boyfriend to us, you would have been valedictorian. Well, right. how far, how close were you to, the, how close were you to being valedictorian? I was close. I was close. Okay. But but you know, I wanted to go to the prom with a 
Denny, I wanted to go with Denny, and it wasn't really linked, and, and it was a long way from my being a valedictorian. I think so, but she <laughs> just had to get that in. <laughs> She was so mad about it. There are a lot of <laughs> Jewish comedians and comedy writers. Um, do Jews have a similar sense of humor, no matter where they come from? And what's it about, Jewish humor? What's it about? You know, I, once I went, there was this famous show, Sid Caesar, The Show of Shows, and uh, which was, you know, one of the ultimate Jewish comedy shows ever on the air. And once I watched a panel on television of all the comedy writers, and, and the comedy writers were all these famous guys, Mel Brooks, and you know, there were a lot of very famous comedy writers, Woody Allen wrote for the show shows, and the, the uh, interviewer asked them to explain what Jewish comedy was about, and they got into such a big fight that the interviewer had to stand up. <laughs> I don't think we know. You know, I, I think that in in the culture, the notion of laughing is incredibly important. Mm -hmm. Maybe because of the very tragic, the, you know, the enormous number of tragedies that have occurred. But but every culture has had an enormous number of tragedies, and not every culture is funny. You know, yeah. I I never wanted to go to Sweden, for example, because my assumption was that it wasn't a funny place. Probably not. <laughs> But it's important to me, self-deprecation seems to be part of it. Um, I think self-deprecation is enormously right, big part of it. Right. And, and also how important it is to make the other person laugh. Right, Culturally, right. it's very important. I mean, we, we, we were raised to know that we had to make everyone laugh at dinner every single night. Really? My whole life. I mean, yeah, it was a really big thing. We, both my parents really wanted us to make them laugh, and my brother and I are relatively funny. You know, my brother is extremely funny. Uh-huh, uh-huh. He's funnier than I am. Wow. My parents weren't expecting us to make them laugh. Really? Nah. What did they want? I don't know. I mean, I have to think about that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe she wanted me to be valedictorian. I mean, that was only number two. Yeah, well, <laughs> but, did, but, but was there an aspect of guilt? Like, did she say, that's great that you're number two? Or did she say, why aren't you number one? Maybe being Jewish is, you know, it's uh -huh. never enough on some level. Well, I think that, that I think that's certainly true for uh, black parents as well. It certainly was true of my parents. It was, it was sort of never enough. It was, it was... It was never enough. You know, I remember when uh, I got my first college admissions, early decision to Oberlin and full scholarship and early decision. And later that evening, I heard my mother telling somebody on the phone that not only was it full scholarship, it was like travel, it was books, it, <laughs> <laughs> it was spending money, all of which uh -huh. it was not. And it, my uh -huh. feeling was, you know, like, I've got this great, great yeah, scholarship. It's Isn't it enough? <laughs> Isn't it Look, enough? <laughs> when I published my first novel, uh, many years ago, 25 years ago, uh, a book called No Charge for Looking about the Middle East. I did a little, tiny little media thing, and, you know, my mother watched me, and the next day she saw some other guy on some other show promoting mm -hmm. his book, and she, she called me, and she said, you know, that guy spoke a lot of languages. You speak English. <laughs> I know, but, you know, American TV isn't English. Right. And you could have, and you could have been, a, been valedictorian. I could have. We're, we're going to take a short break, and then I'll be back with more with Esther Cohen after the following message. Oh, those boys are much too much. Those boys are much too much. We got the spirit. We're hot. We can't be stopped. We got the spirit. We're hot. We can't be stopped. We're going to beat them and bust them. The smallest moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. Take time to be a dad today. Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York, and I'm talking to Esther Cohen, Executive Director of the Bread and Roses Cultural Project at Local 1199, and author with Roz Chast of Don't Mind Me and Other Jewish Lies. Um, and I might add, also author of God is a Tree, uh, a book of prayers for middle age. Why don't you read one of your poems for me? Okay. I'm, you know, the poems are titled with numbers, so I'm going to read you number 33. Okay. I'm getting older. 
I've never prayed before. What I've done on some occasions is mumble when the time seemed appropriate, but now I really pray. It's hard getting older, and it isn't. Amen. Do we need different prayers as we grow older? Yes, we do. And I, I'd like to read number three, if you okay, don't mind. Okay, okay. Because this is a, one of the first prayers that I wrote when I uh, started thinking about what kind of prayers we need as we get older. Mm -hmm. Everyone is younger and thinner than I am. So what, so what, so what, amen. <laughs> I what, think what are you, what are you, so okay, you're praying about uh, your weight, your body image. What other things are, do you pray about more as you, as you grow older? You know, here's the thing. I'm not a prayer type. You know, I, I'm, I'm not, um, I grew up in a very traditional we, they kind of family where it was us and them. And I had a bas mitzvah, and um, you know, I, I actually at my bas mitzvah I gave a speech about Dr. King and how we should all go south and uh, change the world. And, mm -hmm. and the congregation debated whether I was right or wrong, which was good. You know, the mm -hmm. fact that they debated it was good. But uh, when, as I grew older, I wanted to create a world that was more we, no they's, all we, and. Um, I always felt that prayer books should be for anybody who wanted to pray, and they should be kind of anti-holy without the bespoke, bespeak, you know, that, all, all those words that are kind of anti-holy that are uh, rigorously part of every single prayer book, no matter what your religion mm -hmm. is. And um, as I got older and older and thought, maybe I should pray, my son got his ears pierced, you know, I, I felt like... Um, Maybe I should write those prayers because they didn't exist. Anytime I saw a book in a bookstore with the word pray in it, I'd buy it, especially if it was poems. Mm -hmm. And uh, they ten tended, for the most part, to be written by people who seemed like holy men, not women with a sense of humor. Right. Would you write a prayer for my 401k? I'd like to. Please I'd do. really Please like do. to. Write it soon. I'd like to. <laughs> I, I've written a bunch of prayers for Barack Obama. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Tell me about Local 1199 and the Bread and Roses Project. Um, you know, 1199 is an amazing, miraculous union that represents an enormous number of people who work in the healthcare field, uh, in nursing homes and hospitals, and, you know, the... the cradle to grave people who are with us when we're born and with us when we die. And uh, the union was started 50 years ago by a, a visionary immigrant from Russia named Leon Davis. And Leon had a friend who was a uh, large, funny friend named Mo Foner. And uh, Mo called himself the Flo Zigfield of the labor movement. And, and Mo wanted in the spirit of the Bread and Roses strike in Lawrence in 1912, Mo wanted the union to provide cultural opportunities for its members. So 29 years ago, he started the only labor union gallery in the country, which is still in our headquarters at 310 West 43rd Street, which has eight exhibits a year of interest to working people. And um, he started many, many programs where he brought well-known artists who did any number of wonderful things in the arts into the universe of healthcare workers. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and when he created a board, he used this brilliant couple, Ossie Davis and Ruby D, who were postal workers at the time, but they were also incredibly gifted theater people who could do anything. They could sing and dance and write and perform. And Ossie and Ruby brought all their friends into the universe of 1199, so Harry Belafonte and, and Sidney Poitier. You know, a lot of people came to us to do a range of things right. that were wonderful. Now, Unseen America is, is a project where you put cameras into the hands of union workers and have them go out and shoot things, and so the society can see their vision or the kinds of things that they're picking up. You know, right? Unseen America, it, it, so when I, in 93, I came to Bread and Roses to work full time. And um, what I was really interested in was figuring out how to get the visions and voices of working people into the larger public. 
how to create a visual democracy which was inclusive. And in two, we're a nonprofit, which, you know, is synonymous for always broke. <laughs> and uh, a volunteer in my office brought me 100 cameras. A woman named Dan Newman Bacall brought 100 cameras from a camera store that opened in her neighborhood. And she'd been with me a lot. And, you know, I, I asked people to give me their pens for work, not yours, but in general, for working people. So she had gone into the store, and the guy's father had been a union organizer in the 40s, and he handed her 100 cameras. Mm -hmm. So we devised a, a program in 2000 called Unseen America, where we gave cameras and 12-week classes with professional photographers who spoke the language of the people who took the pictures to migrant workers and nannies and home health aides, eight, 815 groups of people around the country to tell the stories of their lives from the perspective of what they see. Mm -hmm. And in the state of New York, we partnered with something called WDI, which is the training arm of the AFL-CIO. And we've done 25, 25 classes with workers all over the state of New York who tell the story of the life of New York State from the perspective of workers. And then you uh, organize exhibits where these pictures are shown. We've had 500 exhibits. Wow. Yeah, we've and the, and this book, Unseen America, and this book, yes, Volume One, uh -huh. Unseen America, which this this book represents the first twenty five classes. Okay, and will there be more books? More books, more classes, more okay. everything, as long okay. as I can raise the money for the camera. You know, it's interesting the uh, the the project, you know, uh, are, are the, but the stories that are told by these pictures. I mean. This sort of remind me in a, at a visual level of the kinds of stories that Studs Terkel used to exactly. get from his interviews, you know, with, with, with working people. Exactly. Uh, they're sort of, the photographs are another way of giving working class people a voice. Very interesting. Um, the idea was to create a visual democracy. And, you know, even the Department of Labor under Secretary of Labor Elaine Chow brought this exhibit to the DOL and friends of mine in Washington. So we brought the worker photographers to Washington, and friends of mine say it's the only time she's ever had workers in the Department of Labor uh -huh. talking about their life. In the Department of Labor. Yeah. We, ha we had a book party at the Guggenheim Museum with a thousand workers from wow. all over the country. Wow. It's interesting that you are a poet and a novelist in the in the union business. Though I think of other um, writers who were associated with sort of the, the, the working class, whether it's Tilly Olson, Studge Turkle, Grace I, Paley. I, I, I'm sorry. Grace Paley. Grace Paley. Um, I don't know if Raymond Carver sort of fits. I know he was poor <laughs> for a long time and he was, he was a writer. He was my favorite. My was favorite really? Writer. Okay, okay. Uh, he might fit in there as well. Well, I'll tell you the link. You know, I've been thinking a lot about, you know, what is the link between these three books? And, um, you know, I, I came up with this idea, which may or may not be correct. You know, uh, what I'm most interested in is other people's stories, mm -hmm. giving people the opportunity to tell their stories and figuring out some way for those stories to uh, be in the larger public. And Unseen America, the reason why you, we used cameras and not um, pens and paper and the, the usual narrative form is because I teach a free writing class at 1199 called Workers mm -hmm. Write. Mm -hmm. And my language skills, as my mother pointed out, are not very extensive. I can only teach the class in English and bad <laughs> Spanish. <laughs> And, and, you know, many, many workers in this country come from other countries, and it seemed to me that the camera would allow them to tell their stories, no matter what country they came from. The mm -hmm. visual language is a universal one. So, so this book is about uh, the stories of, of many who live this country. The Don't Mind Me is really a book about the language, the stories that were told in these convoluted, complex ways by the world my parents lived in. And this book is my story. That God is a tree is, is is kind of my story about what it feels like to get older, to get older, and uh, worry about my four hundred one k. Right, right. These are really hard times uh, for everybody, uh, and and especially for for you know people you know, the working class people. Um, 
are people going to be able to find room for artistic expression when they're worried about putting on the food food on the table, or mm. especially now? We need it more now. Yeah. Especially now. You know, um, the state of New York had a meeting. There, there was a uh, group of people involved in helping all the workers who are now out of work around the state of New York. And I went to that meeting and made a very strong argument that they have to add a cultural piece. Mm -hmm. We need roses. You know, the women in Lawrence, Massachusetts, who were very poor in 1912 when they struck for bread and roses, they were very poor. Their kids were working in the mills. And they came up with this slogan themselves, this slogan that made sense in all the languages that they all spoke because they came from, you know, so many countries. And they said, what we want are bread and roses. I think when times are hard, we need the roses more than we do when times are not hard. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll look for the, uh, for the next Unseen America and more uh, photographs of America as seen through 1199 workers. Thank you very much for being here. Thank um, you so much, too. Don't Mind Me and Other Jewish Lies has just been published by Hyperion for the City University of New York and One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy.